Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to another episode of The Crossroads. I am your host, Rashida Green, and this is the show for and about environmental justice and those who fight the fight with skin as melanated as the days are long. (laughs) Knowledge is power and we are breaking down stereotypes one episode at a time. As you can hear, I'm not alone today. I have a friend to the room. Miss Brandy Brooks is back again. Brandy, hello. Hello. Sorry, I'm just so excited That's, to be back. I can't help it. It's fine. It's totally fine. So, you'd like to get the show started by giving some flowers. Is there anyone that you want to give some flowers to? I do. I want to start off by giving flowers to some of the amazing folks that I know who are running for office in uh, in Pennsylvania, in Maryland, and in the District of Columbia, uh, who are running for office and are competing in the June 2nd primaries. Uh, some great folks in Pennsylvania, Rick Krajewski, Nydea Graves, and Nikhil Saval, who are running for local and state office. In Maryland, wanting to give props to Dalbin Osorio, who's running for Montgomery County School Board at large. And in D.C., wanting to give props to Janice Lewis-George, who is running uh, for Ward 4 uh, council member. And, you know, these are all uh, folks of color, incredible progressive leaders of color who are out there fighting to be in the decision making seat around the kind of policies that impact our environmental health, our physical health, our economic health, all of the different things that we are seeing um, being hit so hard right now in uh, in this time of COVID, but that we know are being hit hard all of the time. Uh, So I just want to like really thank those folks for the work that they do uh, every day and particularly for the work that they're doing right now as candidates. Um, Yeah, we need we need them and we need them in office. So make sure, especially if you are in those June 2nd primaries, that you are out and you are voting and you are looking for the folks who are have got our back um, on the issues that matter. Awesome. So for me, I'm going to actually give flowers to someone that I haven't met in person, but I've met through through podcasting. Her name is Tracy, and she is the creator of Melanated Mom Podcast. Nice. And I'm giving her flowers today because she put out last week a very, very beautiful episode about givers. And I'll I'll link it so that you all can take a listen to it. But it was very powerful. It's only 20 minutes. And all of us, like our podcasting circle of, of girlfriends, were all very moved. I know it's, she has just been very horribly impacted by COVID, she and her, her family. Mm. And in just telling her family and telling the, her greater community about you know her hardships, the, the blessings that she got, like the abundance of blessings that she mm. received was just well more than what she could have imagined and I you know the last couple episodes I've just been really kind of trying to you know talk about very important things but also have a vibe that doesn't make people feel more stressed just trying to do things that can at least relax us in some way and I just wanted to say that her message was just so powerful and I encourage everyone to listen to it you know if you feel compelled in your heart to give please do. But also Mm -hmm. if you are someone that likes to give, recognize that sometimes you need to be poured into as well. And that was one of the major lessons that that Tracy points out in her podcast. So um, giving flowers to her on today. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So sis, now when you and I talked, you said you wanted to talk (laughs) about something very colorful and I'm going to let you introduce this, the subject matter that you wanted to get into. Yeah, so I want to premise this by saying that I was on a call earlier today. I'm part of an organization called the Political Healers Project. I'm one of its co-directors, and we are hosting these weekly healing circles for members of our political healers community because so many of us, um, especially you know, women of color, people of color, uh, are leading the charge when it comes to defending and protecting and showing up for uh, our families and our communities during this time. And so we created this healing space where we get to share practice with one another 
um, to, to, like you said, to pour into each other because we are so busy pouring out mm -hmm. and we need the things that restore us so that we can continue that fight because we can't do it on empty. And the healing circle that one of my colleagues out of, uh, out of Buffalo, New York led today was that was a, a session on radical imagination. And she asked us to do this exercise of closing our eyes and imagining a day in our lives when we are free from oppression. And she walked us through the imagining from the moment we wake up, how we feel, you know, who we're with, what we're seeing as we wake up, you know, what our bodies feel like. Um, all the way through the steps of us getting ready, getting out to whatever our work is, envisioning what that work is, who we get to interact with, how we get to do our work, what it looks like to come home, who we're connecting with, and all the way through until the time we lay our heads back down um, and, you know, and get ready to go to sleep at the end wow. of the day. And yeah, wow is right. It is. You know, and I, I love the way that she talked about this session, this session, um, uh, and, and her name, I want to give her some props to actually Emily Tirana. She works at an organization called Clean Air. And again, they're part of this fight for environmental justice um, in Buffalo. So just highlighting that so often when we are in these fights against all the shit that is coming down on us, what we don't take time to do what what we're often um told not to do or told that we don't have time to do or we tell ourselves that we don't have time to do is envision a future beyond this trash moment um yeah. because I, look i'm gonna be honest come on these now. last these last few months this is a trash moment yeah and there are things going down in my family right now um my mom has been sick with covid uh you know listening to friends who have lost family members who have lost friends who are, are being sick who are not getting health care um watching what is happening oh my goodness watching what is happening yeah um with our public leadership at, <laughs> at every level and i don't yes. and, right i don't even want to call it leadership right <laughs> that's what you want to call it exactly and so i am feeling just so angry and i and i just I'm feeling so angry and one of the things is this system tries to trap us in in that in that space of anger, frustration, despair, self-blame and self-loathing. Like the reason we're all experiencing this is is because we were somehow not good enough as yeah. opposed to because we have systems that are literally trying to kill us. Yeah. Um and one of the things that the system is trying to steal from us, in addition to our resources and our labor and our very bodies and our connections to one another, is our imagination. And the choice to envision a future beyond this world, another alternative, is a hugely radical act. And it's a hard one. It is a tough one. Because again, this system inundates us with so much and tries to tell us that there are no alternatives. Mm. And then even if we want there to be alternatives and we know we need them, it tries to just inundate us with grief and anger and despair. So that choice to practice radical imagination is, it, it, is, a, it is a bold, vulnerable, courageous and beautiful thing to do and i think about um i think about why i love sci-fi uh and I one of the reasons i love sci-fi yes you and i have bonded over this so many times but one of the reasons that i love a writer like octavia butler who i cannot say enough oh, about if yes. you haven't read octavia butler you go get some time. octavia butler right now away. like i say start with parable of the sower and parable of the talents but literally just get anything Kindred. she's written and start reading it. Get, like, yeah. if you're not reading it right now, I need you to immediately go start Stop, reading. Stop, pause this. Yeah, actually, the, yeah, like, it, it's funny. Adrienne Marie Brown says this in her book, Emergent Strategies, because so much of that is based on Butler's writings. And there's this, like, footnote that she has where she's like, 
if you don't know what I'm talking about and you haven't read Octavia Butler, I need you to put down my book, go buy some of her books, read them, and then come back to my book. That is my instruction also for this podcast. We will be here. You need to get Octavia Butler in your life. <laughs> um, That's right. Wiser and, words. Not yes. spoken. <laughs> and so, you know, when I, when I read, it's this power of envisioning the alternative, but also what it looks like and what it feels like and what we will go through getting to build out that alternative. I mean, that is the entire story of Parable of the Sower, Parable of the Talents, and it is just beautiful struggle. It is it is honest, it is real, um, but it is also visionary. And that is actually one of the gifts that we have where we are positioned as black folks, as as femmes, as queer folks, as poor folks, that we know that this system is not working for us. And so we actually have the ability to think there's got to be something different. And, and often we have the capacity to start to imagine things differently, whether they come from our ancestral traditions, our family practices, or just our bold creativity and, and will to live regardless of what the system says. And so we ha- like that is, that is one of our gifts. It is one of our most important gifts and we have got to practice it. You know, something, so a couple things. So like a couple points that you've hit on already. One is that, you know, what we're living in, as one of my friends in California says, we're living in a white man's fantasy. Ooh, yes. (laughs) Yeah, we are. And and there's some specific white white men who are having this fantasy, by the way. Oh my God. And, but this is also as part of like, this is an extractive economy. And I've, mm-hmm. I've touched about, I've talked about this a little bit before, but basically it's an extractive economy is one that basically takes away natural resources or mm-hmm. non-renewable resources as well, mm-hmm. which is also what we're doing mm-hmm. and for sale and for trade. And it creates inequities, obviously, between mm-hmm. those who have power and those who don't. And there's a lot of different, you know, pillars of power as I've been researching and found but some mm-hmm. uh, just to kind of touch on what you were saying about you know what you're really saying is creating a new vision for how we see our future and that how that is the beauty of afrofuturism mm, how it's yes. the beauty of of sci-fi mm-hmm. and also of creating a regenerative economy yes. and there's four things that like one of my professors told me and i'm just gonna read them and i hope they hit people they're gonna <laughs> hit a little different first one was what the hands do the heart or the heart learns Mm, Um, and you apply mm -hmm. labor to meet needs Mm -hmm. Two, if it's the right thing to do and the just thing to do people have every right to do it oh yes three if we aren't prepared to govern we aren't prepared to win truth and four if it's not soulful it's not strategic oh I just wanted to sprinkle, sprinkle there. Mm, sprinkle it, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, I just wanted to, I just wanted to bring that in um, to the conversation because you know these are, this is, these are the ways that we're going to have to think, and I think that's, you know, the beauty of kind of like what we've experienced being in academia, also just like being in the grassroots mm-hmm. level and learning and organizing teaches you these things, but these aren't always passed on to the masses, and I think. Yeah, that's really a great thing that we're we're working on. We're doing absolutely. Right now. And Carry you on know, now. no, so I, I I love it. It's one of the reasons why I love your podcast because there is so much, and we think of these as all these separate spheres. That, you know, the ivory tower, the grassroots, politics, spirit. You know, all these things being you know such separate realms, but we are whole people. Yeah, I don't walk around as just one thing. I don't walk around as just a woman or just black or just Latina or just a person with a degree or just a person who's faced housing insecurity or just a a Christian who deeply believes and like is rooted in her Lord. Like I walk around as all those things together all the time. Right. And so the solutions and the way that I have to think about the world has to honor all of that stuff or I'm cutting off pieces of myself. You better come on now. I see it's like this is the thing and so you know what you are doing on this podcast is that you are you are taking and and it's it's one of the reasons why I love 
I, you know, I love our friendship. I love having you as a movement colleague, colleague, and I love being able to support this work that you're doing because we've got to bring together um, ourselves, all the different pieces of ourselves, but then also ourselves collectively, the knowledge, the wisdom that we have within our communities and within our networks that, again, that we are told by this system that we don't have, right? that we don't have anything that matters, that we don't have anything that's valuable. But we've got so much that's valuable. Otherwise, the system would not spend so much time trying to convince us otherwise. No, I mean, we run, I mean, for example, <laughs> a prime example, we run social media. Twitter mm-hmm. is what it is. We make Twitter happen, black mm-hmm. Twitter specifically, ah, yes. makes Twitter happen. Right. If there and was no black Twitter, it, I don't know what other people are talking. I have no idea what other people are talking about, and I don't care. <laughs> right, I only but, care but, what black Twitter has to say. <laughs> but like Twitter would be also be so much less rich without black Twitter. And folks yeah, know, like no. black Twitter is a thing. Like it black is Twitter a is a very thing. specific thing. And even folks who are outside of the black community know that like black Twitter has developed this culture, this identity within it that, you know, that has all the the facets of blackness, including the ones where we're problematic with each other and other people. <laughs> like, look, yeah. we're, we're going to own it. Um, but like, that's because wherever we go as black folks, as indigenous folks, as people of color, we bring ourselves with us. Yes. Um, and... You know, I think one of the reasons that folks try and work so hard to exclude us from places or to keep us down and to keep us chopped into pieces um, separate from each other, but separate from pieces of ourselves is because they know when we show up as our full selves, we are so powerful and we make change everywhere. Like you can't you can't stop it. Even when people try to stop it, you you got to press so hard to try to press us. And we're still always popping out. Be like, nope, nope. Sorry, I'm going to pop out over here. I'm going to pop out over there. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to bust free from this. Um, And and and, you know, I think one of the things that we are struggling with right now but also that people are opening up to in this time so you know i said originally this is a trash moment um and there are pieces of this that feel like just a a, a blazing dumpster fire oh yeah um, blazing dumpster fire uh and fire can also be a refining and a purifying force um and there is also this way in which i think going through the fire of this time is helping us to discard things that are no longer useful and get really clear about what is essential. Mm. Um, you know, and this phrase gets is getting talked about, or tossed around all the time with essential workers. Yeah. But it's actually revealing something, even though that is just that is it such really a political is. catchphrase. It is actually revealing that there are folks who are essential to our economy, who we constantly try to keep hidden and underpaid and underappreciated but when it comes down to brass tacks yeah you better bet those food workers those farm workers food process workers food Nurses. service workers folks in the grocery stores health care workers domestic care workers child mm-hmm. care workers you know yeah all of a sudden you we have to them. realize you need them because the rest of us don't function without that yeah. so that so it is actually re- like helping us to recognize that there's a whole bunch of stuff that we devote time to or told to put our resources and that our attention to significant and useless. Yes. And that the essential stuff is being revealed right here. So now this is the question. What are we going to do with this moment of revelation? Because just because we have the revelation doesn't mean that we're going to decide to act on it. This is a choice that we are now facing in this moment. And that kind of brings us to this topic that I that I really wanted to talk about today, which is, are we going to commit to building the real future that we need? This is this is my question for us. And again, I want to I want to give props to Adrienne Marie Brown because she she wrote a fantastic blog post about this several weeks ago there are other folks again especially in BIPOC again black indigenous and people of color movement communities who are asking this question right now Mm -hmm. um and there is something that we've got to wrestle with which is that even though we've had indications all along all along all along that this system doesn't serve us, 
that it exploits us, that it demeans us, that it's constantly taking from us. We've also been trained to think that this is all there is and yeah. that our worth depends on how successful we can be in meeting the demands of this system. And we are at a moment, and actually we're always at this moment, where we have to decide whether we're going to accept that lie or whether we are going to live into the truth of who we are, what we're capable of, and what we need and deserve. And so with that being said, I mean, I think the natural question that I'm sure people wonder is, well, what's stopping us? Like, well, what is it that... I mean, can we point, I know we could probably, we could do it, but could we point to, you know, is it just social? Is it, is it, could it be that if we were able to figure out, you know, where we wanted to be and how we wanted to get there? And if you're asking me personally, I would say, I do not see it happening in this country. So for example, and you and I have talked about this, Mm -hmm. if we were to, let's say, all of us were to say peace and move to Ghana what would that look like for you know first I mean aside from the glamorous white parties and just (laughs) aside from all that I mean what would that look like you know who decides who gets to go because if you listen to some you know of the you know the hotels their attitude is, I try not, because I, you know, I try to tread light with that shit. But anyway, <laughs> if you were to talk to the hotels, you know, they would say, oh, well, if you have a white wife, you can't come. If you've got, you know, if you're mixed or you wear wigs or whatever, you can't go. But to me, and this is what I mean about the social piece, is that that's infighting, which is completely useless and doesn't serve us and is only what we've had done to us for centuries dividing us up and telling us one class or group is better than the other so why will we do that in this new society that we could actually create ourselves but like these are some of the I feel like some of the micro problems if that's what you want to call it if we're saying that (laughs) I mean if you're saying that you know or I'm saying that like um structural racism is a macro problem I would say the divisions between light and dark skin and complexion would be like a micro like it's there we know it (laughs) it's stupid and if we probably had less time to worry about the big shit we could possibly focus on this and and correct it very quickly but we haven't and so there's these there's a lot of different layers to figuring that out and like so where should we start where do you think uh, we should start? Yeah. So so I want to I want to start with a little bit of reframing. Macro and micro are levels of operation, not levels of importance. So when we talk about the system of racialized gendered capitalism that we are currently living in, it is an integrated system that operates at multiple levels, going from the historical all the way down to the internalized. Um, But again, I'll highlight Emergent Strategies because it's such a great book. One of the things that Adrian Marie Brown talks about is this idea of of fractals as as a critical way of understanding the world. And, And the idea that in many ways, the small is all there is. And the large is is the replications of what we do at small scales. And so we we have to practice the small so that we can then practice it at the next level, at the next level, at the next level. But it's not like any one of those levels is more important than the other. And we have to understand that we're living in and interacting with all of those different systems from the history of uh, the limit experience that we have with what it looks like to live a life outside of racialized gendered capitalism to the obscuring of the times when we have built things in a different mode because we get a lot of our history obscured so that our power can be obscured yes the culture um the dominant culture of whiteness but also the sort of internalized um racial inferiority culture that lives within that um we have institutional systems from the finance system to the housing system to the education system to the 
uh, system of mass incarceration and criminal injustice that are constantly reinforcing these notions. We have our interpersonal interactions, which include our interactions with white folks, our interactions with other communities of color, and certainly our interactions with ourselves and the ways that we replicate the structures of oppression that we're receiving from the outside. And then again, you know, there's a big thing at the root of that, this narrative um, that tells us who we are are and are not who we can be or cannot be um and you know so when i hear stuff like well you can't come if you've got a white spouse or if you've got mixed kids what i hear in that is the the internalized inferiority the internalized box that we are told that we have to live in the failure to believe in our own imaginations and possibilities I look at my beautiful family, which is a multiracial family where we are black and Latina and white and it's all mixed up together. And, you know, one of my great greats was a white Scottish man who came over and freed and married a, a African woman who was a slave. And I'm like, well, all of that's me. I'm not giving and, I, and I'm not willing to give up a single part of it. So, again, what I imagine has to be able to hold all that I am. Otherwise, it's not the thing. You know, I think what we have to start practicing, this is this is why this radical imagination is so important, because it also starts with, with something that you just said, which is, do we even think it's possible? And this is actually one of the first things that we have to wrestle with. I'm not willing to cede it being possible, being impossible in the United States yet. I am not willing to cede this country because I've grown up here, I've lived all my life here, um, I'm a citizen here, my ancestors put their blood, sweat, and tears into this soil and into making sure that I could be where, where I am now. So, um, you know, no, I'm invested in this and, and I am going to reclaim what's mine. Um, and that doesn't mean that we can't build it in other places as well. I think we should be building this all over the world globally. And there's a whole beautiful global movement around what it looks like to make this transition out of whiteness, out of patriarchy, out of capitalism, um, and into the future that we need um, that honors our indigeneity, that honors our complexity, that honors our whole spectrum of types of leadership. Um, but like, we we have to, and, and, and we have to decide, and like, this is the thing, it is a decision. We have to decide to believe that it is possible to decide to believe that the unreasonable is possible. And I am not willing to see the capacity for imagination to the enemy forces that are trying to kill me and my family. And I want to be honest about this. They have been imagining a crazy world. You said we're living in some white man's fantasy. Yeah. They have been imagining a crazy world that breaks all bounds of like human rights and actual United States law. And they they believe it's possible. So they brought it into being. I am not going to say that crazy, like wealthy white men. And again, I don't think that's all wealthy white men, but there are some like crazy, destructive, mm -hmm. wealthy white men um, and their partners who decided that a totally unreasonable future was possible and then brought it into being. I say I have as, at least as much imagination. Yeah, as power him. of the mind is not a joke. I, you know, it is, I, it is not a joke. I think we can. I think it's definitely going to be like something that we're going to have to really think radically about. I, I, um, I have. Mm -hmm. I admit that I have difficulty imagining it, just because I think that there's going to be so many things that would slow down the some of the progress unfortunately but you know you know and this is but the things that we're talking about are really more of like what is considered like a regenerative economy and mm -hmm. something another important tidbit of information is that <laughs> regeneration plus cooperation yields mm. ecological and social well-being Oh, don't you just nice? feel like you want to lift up on a cloud after i do that? i yes. do you yes. know 
And it's like, even though I do, and I think this was a, a part of my struggle in my uh, master's program because it is very radical. Like all these things that I'm talking about are the, mm-hmm. is the radical shit we talked about. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, and it was hard for me. It, was, it still is a challenge for me um, to think that broadly sometimes because I see the some of the, the hiccups, I guess, and some of like, you know, some of the issues. Like we can't even get beyond the fact that like – even sometimes I think about the way like white people predict or show space. Like if you think about aliens, mm-hmm. right? First and second, there's there was like one or two people of color, but everybody else is white. And mm-hmm. I was thinking, you know, this is said in like well into the future. Mm-hmm. But even then, they <laughs> even still they mm-hmm. see themselves or saw themselves because, you know, when aliens came out as being the mainstay Mm -hmm. and that the only thing that would not have them be the mainstay is uh you know xenomorphs Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know cutting their heads off and shit and it's like it's it's you know and and enough something else too i'm sorry this is not this is a little less you know i guess textbook and a little more speculative but like (laughs) one of my friends and i get into a pretty routine disagreement about black panther like his whole thing is he doesn't understand why it is that we can't see africa in the same way as we are imagining wakanda being that why is it that we can't pick ghana or why Mm -hmm. is it that we can't pick nigeria and say we could create a wakanda like place in Mm -hmm. an actual place on earth Mm mm-hmm and I don't fully disagree, but I definitely don't think that imagining something that is, for all intents and purposes, not possible at this time. You know, we don't have vibranium. But why is it that, or I don't know. I mean, I think maybe this, the question is that we, we get hung up on on actually imagining what Africa could be like for us and kind of leaning on images of what it maybe isn't or could never be or whatever something that's so far beyond what we can imagine that we have to put it someplace else you but, know but the thing is like i think i think it was muhammad ali who said this or no 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 was it nelson mandela i keep getting my inspirational quotes but like you know it's always impossible it was mandela uh until it's done you yeah. know what you know what was impossible until it was done the end of chattel slavery in the united states oh my god you know what was impossible until it was done the fact that black folks would have equal rights to vote even on paper you know what was impossible until it was done go into the moon like we want to talk about sci-fi until that happened that was just like crazy science fiction writers writing about nonsense yeah that's true you know so 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 we literally like this is one of our powers as as humans we have the ability to do just about anything that we set our collective minds to and we often use that power for terrible evil and injustice but that's not the only thing that it can be used for True. we can we can imagine we have imagined whole new ways of being whole new economies whole new technologies whole new government systems um we we are capable of so much we gotta stop telling ourselves that we can't i say yes we can build a wakanda in ghana i want to build a wakanda somewhere here in the mid-atlantic because i happen to be over here so i want to build it here too um and we can build it you know in all these different places where we're located but but this is the thing we have to claim our radical imagination and be willing to dream our biggest and boldest visions. We have to be willing to make no little plans. This architect, Daniel Burnham said that um, he was an architect of union station in DC and a you know, big architect in Chicago, but like we have to decide that we're not going to make little plans. We are going to make the biggest, baddest plans that are possible. And then we are going to work toward them every day and we are not going to let go of them and i want to share an example like a a, a real local down home practical things that happen in our universe uh example which is that my church which is the emory fellowship 
uh, United Methodist Church in DC, our pastor had this vision for a church that could be, you know, not just doing like small outreach and missions work in the community, small, like helping the hunger, but that could be providing housing, uh, economic mm. well-being, food, all these different things, uh, like we woven in with spiritual well-being on a massive scale. And he had this particular vision for building out um, this residential and commercial complex um, on the site of our church uh, that could be used to serve these purposes. So he had this vision for a long time, um, worked with folks in the church, built built the church up. And, and, you know, he had this vision when our church was like a handful of folks in a, quote, dying church, mm -hmm. in a church that everyone expected to close any second. And he has held on to that vision for 20 plus years, has held on to that vision, has, has persuaded people into it, has moved political will and resources so that, what was it? I guess it's like four or five years ago now, we moved out of our original church building and into a school so that we could do the renovations to our church building. We had to go through this crazy permitting process in DC where historical preservationists almost were trying to say, you can't do anything on this land. We had to get a, a huge amount of financing for, a, again, a black church, not a wealthy wow. black church, a black church of regular DC folks mm -hmm. who were constantly being challenged by housing insecurity, being pushed out of the city to raise tens of millions of dollars to do this thing, folks had to be willing to be in that church at the Brightwood Education Center for, I think it was close to four years, believing wow. even during the time that we <laughs> were facing all of this pushback, believing that the vision that had been cast, that we had chosen to invest in would come to pass, you know, just at, I guess it was the end of last year, we are in our church now. We are there. This 99 units of permanently affordable housing has been built and families that couldn't wow. be housed in DC have moved in. There is commercial space that we will be developing into a commercial kitchen and restaurant so that people can run businesses out of there. We are doing the thing, but there were people all along the way, right up until practically the end who said it wasn't possible. We need to have a praise break. Yes, we need to have a praise break because <laughs> come on. Like, won't he do it? And see Won't he will? Day. Yes. Like, won't he will? Shout absolutely. out to Deon Cole. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's like, yes, we can. When we marshal our imagination and our faith and our community and our persistence Yes, of course we can. Yes, we always have, in fact. You know, and I want to go back, go to something that, that has been an inspiration for me in thinking about this. I think about the time just after slavery, you know, as we, we went to the Reconstruction era and then started coming out of the Reconstruction era. Mm -hmm. um, and Black folks were trying to figure out how to live and we were getting, we were getting lynched all the time just we were just getting lynched all the time um and didn't have access to the land and the systems and all these other things that we needed so you know what we did what did we do we went and we built our own towns we went and we built our own downtowns we went and we built our own schools we went and did it for ourselves and that doesn't mean it was perfect we still there's classes and there's colorism there's sexism like you know, the stuff. We were still human beings, still, still wrestling with our oppression. But we did the darn thing. We built cooperatives that supported education and businesses and farmers coming together and people buying black land. We did all of these things. And then here's an important thing that we got to recognize happened. And, and I, I want to note, there's a great, great book um, another great book, wonderful black scholar. Her name is Jessica Gordon Nembhart, and the book is Collective Courage, and it's a history of African American cooperative thought and practice. You need to get that book too, because we need to know our history of who we've been and what we've accomplished as a people. Agreed. So one of the things that started happening is, of course, when this system, when the dominant system saw that we 
we're doing this for ourselves, then, you know, it started setting fire to all our shit. Yeah. And see, like, and that's the problem. And nerd alert, that's something that was covered by the Watchmen. Absolutely. Which which was really very well executed Mm -hmm. and discussed in that show. But, you know, that's that's what happened. And, you know, something that's a little seemingly obscure to some people is, you know, like and but uh, but go with me. Travel with me. here. I will travel with you. So. Randomly, I was listening to another a show, the 85 South show, which a very, very drastic difference from this show that I do. <laughs> but but that's it's that's there's room for all of us. Mm-hmm. And they brought up uh, DJ Drama. DJ Drama is a pretty popular um, mixtape producer. He's one of the one of the pioneers of the mixtape game. Mm-hmm. Um, Help like really did a lot of work with Lil Wayne, like right at the height, like one of the highest heights of his career. Mm-hmm. And it just made him the stuff of legends and he got raided by the fbi thinking that what he was doing was illegal even though it wasn't even though he had he was well within his right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to do this and i you know it was interesting that they were you know that the 85 south show was just kind of briefly talking about this and i did some research Mm -hmm. and and you know obviously wanted to talk about it a little more in depth on this show but what was interesting is the fact that here is an, an example of someone who has created a lane for themselves, Mm -hmm. a black person, a person of color has created a lane for themselves. Mm -hmm. And it is immediately thought of as suspicious and vehemently attacked by the powers that be. And Mm -hmm. that is my, that is my concern about trying to create our Wakanda in America is that we've done it before and white folks have burned the shit down. Okay. So, so you're totally right. And a lot of folks live with that fear. And I think that fear is actually what what led us once the dominant systems were, quote, opened to us. And they were never very open. Let's be clear. Um, But once they they were opened, um, that we abandoned the things that we had built. We abandoned our banking institutions. We abandoned our own businesses. We abandoned our culture and said, "Okay, this this has to be the place where we go and and try and invest. And I think there was a lot of trauma that that led to that, that us being like, maybe it'll be safer here. Um, But I also believe, again, that internalized racial inferiority, the belief as a a great Boston activist, uh, Mel King, said at a a talk I went to years ago, the belief that the white man's ice is colder than ours. (laughs) Also a huge part of that. We believe that this system that was never built to serve us was better than the system that we built ourselves. And, you know, I hear echoes of this all the time. Like I talk, I remember testifying um, about uh, when I was running for uh, the Montgomery County Planning Board about the importance of investing in the businesses of people of color so that we could build out our own communities. We didn't need to have folks from like whoever's developing Bethesda come in. We needed to be resourced so that we could develop White Oak into our beautiful like Wakanda and Montgomery County. Right. And there was a county council member who said, well, you know, I mean, black and brown folks deserve nice things, too. And my first thought was, friend, who who said that in investing in us to build out our own communities that we're not investing in nice things? Can, can we can we talk about that? I wish you could that? see the look on my goddamn face right now. Mm-hmm. And I can probably guess who it was. I have an idea. I mean, because... You know, I don't really, I don't really fuck with the school, not the school board. I don't really fuck, I don't fuck with them either. But I don't really <laughs> fuck with the the goddamn council like that because you know what's one of them is already on my hit list or my shit list. <laughs> but like, you know, I, I black and br- okay, right. And okay. and and I and, and you know, I wanted to challenge this council person, but I had a limited amount of time for my testimony and things like that. But I, you know, I did allude to it a little bit too. Where I was like, yeah, we deserve nice things, and we also are capable of building them um, ourselves, and don't ourselves, need you to but, do it. But like deeply embedded in that was the idea that if we didn't get those folks to build it for us, that it's not a comparable nice thing. Mm-hmm. Oh. Come on, like, like, and, yeah. and in addition to making me mad, that hurt me. That hurt me. That that we have so internalized the sense of our own inferiority that we can't even imagine 
that we can actually build a Wakanda. Because one of the things about Wakanda, you know, and people feel all kind of ways about Black Panther, that's fine. But one of the things about it is a beautiful, more technologically advanced than anywhere else on the planet place to live. Yeah. And we Hidden don't away. believe we can do it. I believe in it. I believe, I know that we have one of the beautiful things about black culture and just a quick dip into the HBCU streets. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is just the beauty of, of going to an HBCU. I think you can get this at white schools too, from what I've heard that Mm -hmm. you can, there is a black community and it is also diverse, Mm -hmm. but it is on, on 10 at an HBCU Mm -hmm. and there's everybody. Mm -hmm. There's the, you know, the hood folk, who were just real smart and tatted up and mm-hmm. took their ass on down to Hampton. Mm-hmm. There's the the really rich girls who are just like the Cosbys or whomever else. <laughs> they come to. There's daughters of hip hop stars. Everybody. Mm-hmm. And everyone has a different experience and a different skill and talent. Mm-hmm. There's there were girls who could do your hair. Someone else could make you a bag with with the with our our you know crest on it. Mm-hmm. There was someone else who was real good with a flat iron. Everybody, everyone had a talent. Everyone mm-hmm. has a skill, and we could 100% build Wakanda. Right. I am just not certain if it could be here in these United States of America. That's it. Look, I, I, here here's what I'm gonna say. We it, it, I believe we can build it wherever. Again, we decide to. We can decide to build it in Ghana. We can decide to build it here. The The things that are going to actually create resistance for us are more the same in each place than we'd like to admit. Like, there's a whole bunch of stuff if we go and build this in Ghana, like, that, that we're also... There, there's ways that we're going to be facing resistance no matter where we build it. That's and true. And this is actually the piece that we need to get okay with. Um, because we, in our naivete believe that we can build an alternative to the system and that this system that wants to extract everything from us will somehow just let that happen without interfering. Right. Now, like of all the unreasonable things we think, that's literally the most unreasonable one. Like that that's not grounded in anything. So instead of saying, well, we can only do this if it doesn't get any pushback, which is a, which is an easy way of saying we're just not going to do this at all. How about we say we're going to do this and we expect pushback and therefore we prepare for it. There's a, another amazing book. Um, there's so many good books in the world. Um, it's called uh, This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed, A History of Guns in the Civil Rights Movement. Ah. And one of the things it talks about is the role of self-defense, physical armed self-defense oh, yeah. in the civil rights movement. And again, this is something that we're not supposed to talk about because in the whitewashing of Martin Luther King, you were definitely not supposed to talk about whether or not that man and, and the folks strapped. around him were armed, in, in addition to anything else radical that he ever said. But, like, folks weren't stupid. Like, everybody knew that folks were trying to come for this man. That is why his people walked around armed. Yeah. That is part of how he managed to live for as long as he did. Mm. It was not by being foolish or not expecting that folks were going to try to do everything from, Pull up. you know, from, from, from just like shunning him to jailing him to murdering him. Yeah. And, 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 and again, we can say, well, look, he got murdered. Yes. Well, yeah. His life came to an end, for God's but sakes. for crying out loud, everything that he did in that short lifespan Come on now, like, let's let's not let's not play. So among the things we have to decide is one, that this is possible two that we're willing to do the deep work of deconstructing all of those layers. And it is deep, hard work. It is ongoing work. There are some ways in which we are never finished, but it's also like as an organizing trainer. This is the work that I do with folks around racism, around sexism, around classism, um, all this stuff. And it is like, oh, I tell you, it is hard work, but it's also some of the most beautiful. I was just on a call, uh, this joint fundraiser for some of the candidates I, candidates I mentioned at the beginning of the call, and it was a gathering of a bunch of different folks who've gone to this week-long transformative leadership training um, that gets run by People's Action uh, every year, and folks who had attended over the last three years. This was one of the most beautiful things that I have ever 
participated, gathering all these organizers who had done this deep work training to come together to support three of our own folks who are running for office right now with folks on the call who had gone through this training and run successfully for office and are now candidates in different places and folks who've trained them and all this organizing that we've done. And people, we were sharing stories, we were laughing with each other, we were crying and we were organizing a crap ton of money for these candidates that it is it was, awesome. it was one of the most beautiful and powerful things they ever done so we got to do that work but the reward for it is oh it's like it's life the reward for it is literally life right um and and then we've got to prepare like these folks who are running they don't think that they're going to be able to run against incumbents and have everybody be like okay they don't think that's going to happen they are prepared for resistance let's get prepared in all the different ways that that means i feel like we really need I'm to have a conversation all about getting armed. we re- I'm thank all you about it. thank you we really need to have a serious conversation about like the rights of black people to be armed in the face mm-hmm. of a system that is trying to come at us with arms and you know i want to lift up brianna taylor yes. i want to lift up her partner um folks who had the state come in completely falsely erroneously yeah attack them in her homes kill her and then this man when when oh my gosh i'm sorry i just it's hard for me to talk about this man when when unannounced people burst into his home the fact that he shot at them and now he's being charged with attempted murder and in contrast yeah we have ahmaud aubrey who was jogging in his fucking neighborhood yeah. And two people are allowed to come out with guns and shoot him because they saw somebody running through their neighborhood and decided that he was a threat. Someone I'm who so- doesn't have the proper training, who never, who never in his career, his, the length of his career, or at least the majority of it, had the proper certifications to be doing his job and was allowed to coast because his supervisor let him get away with it. That part, too. I just that I'm the so- one who looks like um old boy's dad from in, in the heat of the night mm-hmm. him the old one the dad and i'm sorry if we are not getting serious about the fact that our lives are already at risk and treated like like so much toilet paper heck not even as good as toilet paper now because we're all loving toilet paper and we're still hating on Look, black love i'm tired of you all with all the goddamn toilet paper right? <laughs> Look, you know, we I've need talked it. about it multiple times and I'm <laughs> sick of going into the damn store and it looks like the Hunger Games. I'm sick of it. Yeah. But it's like uh, we uh, all this stuff where we think that somehow if we don't build out the new system, if we don't build the resistance that that keeps us safe. I'm sorry. Who are I, I want to know who feels safe right now because I don't feel safe. I don't really feel all that safe. That's I feel- why I just stay in, hun- in the house. That's why I just am very much like clink, clink, because I'm not trying to, it's, it's too crazy. So this is the thing, is that Rashida, like you're saying, I want to be in my house where I can stay safe. Brianna Taylor was killed in her house. I know. So, so, so we have got to let go every perception. Both of John was killed in his house. Yes. And we, then the whole courtroom hugged the... Oh, God. We have got to let go the idea that there is anything in this system that keeps us safe without us having to fight for our liberation. You are... Like, we have... And, and it's it's a painful process. Look, again, I was born here in the United States, so I want to believe all the mythology about America as the land of the free and the home of the brave... But I'm sorry, when that is a lie, I need to recognize it and I need to be be willing to set myself free from that lie so that I can build a future based on the truth. I hear you. I, you know, I think the, the, the struggle for us here is as just that we have to find more that's going to unite us and bring us together than the things that will ultimately require us, I think, to until we're ready have our own different functions our own little mini wakandas within the greater good like i just think about just a lot of the in in the black community some of the things that we don't we haven't and we don't address you know the blatant homophobia the Mm -hmm. blatant transphobia Mm -hmm. just the the 
assault and the things that happen to our our girls our boys too mm -hmm. and the hypersexualization of our children just mm -hmm. just to bl put a blanket over it mm -hmm. you will, so everyone can have a seat under that tent of bullshit you know of, of over sexualizing our kids all the time and like and those things have got to be addressed and I think like we can, I want us to build, I would love, I love seeing, I've seen these videos on Instagram of just the protection of the families by armed big old black men. And I love it. <laughs> I am happy to see it. I'm just like, yeah, no one is going to mess with you, sir. Black Rambo with that big ass gun, mm -hmm. you know, good. Because I, I think unfortunately the only way in this country that the gun laws are going to change is when there's more Negroes looking like the rock with guns in their hands. And then it's going to be, or probably not as probably as, you know, they look like the rock, <laughs> but maybe they're as dark as Tyrese. I don't know, but either way it's going to be, that that's the way that we're going to get the gun laws changed because it's it's going to be the person it's like the fear it's the same thing that happened to the black panthers too mm -hmm. <laughs> and, this and, yeah and I, I will say like black brown solidarity it's everybody from who looks like the rock to you know who looks Girl. like the darkest of us because they don't want none of, none of us armed so like they don't want any you know let, let's not pretend that there's some of that's us true. that they're gonna allow to be armed and others of us that yeah, they no. that they are not they don't want none of y'all having guns exactly you look like the two do yeah exactly so so like so like Lienhauer. but but so I, like i hear you i hear you the struggle like how you know how can we possibly do this i what i'm telling you is that this radical imagination stuff is actually how we do it if we want to get to a world where we have healed with one another and are bringing healing to our communities and bringing healing to this planet we first have to envision it and then share those visions with one another. And I am telling you, when we do that from a place of deep authenticity and vulnerability, the humanness in us calls to the humanness in other people. And it can even call them out of the narratives of oppression that they have been locked in and into the place where they desperately want to be vision casting like so there's so many different roles in this movement one of the roles that i have is as a visionary a vision caster and and one of the joys of being able to do that is that when i cast visions about what our future can look like it speaks to something in other people it speaks to a deep need that sometimes they didn't even realize they had it speaks not just to the head but to the heart the gut the body the spirit that is how we call each other into our healed future. But we have got to be willing to go deep enough with ourselves to admit what we dream of. We're so afraid to admit what we dream of because, again, we're told that dreaming is futile. We're told that we can't bother. We're told that we don't have time. We're told to dive it back. We're told that in part because sometimes dreaming of the future and looking at the contrast between the, the vision that we have and the world that it is now gives us terrible grief. That part. Okay. Let us bond by being vulnerable about our grief. Let's be with one another in all of the humanness because our grief is part of that. My grief and my anger at this moment are part of what compels me to build this future. I, like I bring every aspect of that with me. I bring my struggles. I bring the places where I don't think I'm good enough. I bring the stuff that I fear. I also bring my beautiful niece and nephews and I bring my family and I bring the shit that we've gone through and I bring the shit that we've done to each other where I'm like, we can't be doing that to each other no more. I bring all of that. And when I speak from that, it speaks to other people. It speaks to people who have gone through trauma in their families. It speaks to people who have broken relationships. It speaks to people whose folks are dealing with health issues. It speaks to people who have been houseless before. It speaks to people who have had to scrape by and pull up change from the couch cushions. It speaks to people who have struggled with anxiety and depression and other forms of mental illness. But I gotta be willing to speak out of all of that, otherwise I can't call my people to me. I've actually dug in my couch to buy um, buy beer with change. Yeah. 
And it speaks to folks who are judged because you use that change on beer because somebody told you that that's not what a virtuous poor person does. Yeah. All the meanwhile, you're trying to deal with the daily stress of structural oppression and you're trying to get a little bit of something that makes it so maybe that particular day doesn't feel Won't suck so, so hard. awful that you can't move on to the next day. So like, what are your, what are your, what's your vision? Like, what do you, what oh. just add like a, like what a, if you're willing to share it, you know, I feel like we should turn on some singing bowls or something, but like, <laughs> what is your, <laughs> that's what I've been on these last <laughs> few episodes. Like, let's listen to some soothing background music. I, I love it. If you want to put on some singing bowls and then like we can bring the vision in. Oh my I'm God. I'm all about that. You ain't said nothing but a word. Oh, no. You just wait a minute. Okay. Let I'm me ready. get this together. This is exciting stuff. <laughs> You know, yeah, I just I would be very interested to, you know, to know once clear everything. OK, let okay. me find the I'm using my I want relax melodies to give me some money. So I'm going to say <laughs> that I'm using the relax melodies app, yep. which is free, but they do have better stuff if you pay and I haven't paid. So a lot of this I can't use, which makes me pretty sad. All right. Relax <laughs> melodies. Go sponsor my girl, Rashida. Please give me some money so that she can share more singing bowls. That's right. And other things. <laughs> you ready? Yep. Mm. Isn't that nice? That is beautiful. So, your vision. My vision. So, I, my goal in my life, the purpose that I'm working toward, is the building out of these communities, these, these whole self-sufficient communities where we gather ourselves on land, where we are living um, as families practicing radical democracy, uh, radical economies and, and economic sharing in the fullness of what economy and economics can mean um, and sustainable living on the land, recognizing that we are whole and part of the land and part of the air and part of the water and not separate from it. We It'll be founded around uh, sustainable agriculture, which is one of the things I'm really passionate about, building sustainable hyper-local food systems. Um, again, it will be built around practicing forms of democracy that really respect and honor the ways that all of us should have a voice in our governance and ways of understanding and recognizing that the labor that we all do, whether it is labor at home, outside of the home, is valuable, is essential and deserves to be compensated and whatever the fruits of that labor are need to be shared equitably among the folks who are generating it. Um, I want to build out these communities. I, I look to models like um, housing cooperatives. I look to models like uh, co-housing, to models like intentional communities for how we build the structures around this. I look at permaculture as a guide for how we do the agriculture. There are so many different folks looking at radical forms of economic justice. And there are people out there talking about this concept of just transition. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of building out the things that we need in the ways that model what we believe is possible and what we desire to achieve. And, and so in this visioning exercise that I got to go through today, I got to think about what it would be like. And, and, and I, want, I want to pause and I want to name that this is not some go out into the backwoods away from everybody and build it. I believe there's room for that too, but I also believe in building this in a way that's accessible, especially to black folks, indigenous folks and other folks of color, many of whom have been gathered in places, whether it's cities, whether it is rural towns, whether it is reservations. So I wanna build it where we are, um, as close to where we are and so we can get there. I want it to be led by us I want it to be infused by spiritual practice, recognizing that that is an essential component of humanness. And for me, that means a community that, that's based around people of the book, we call ourselves, you know, so it's um, Jews, Christians, Muslims, who share uh, a, a faith foundation that we can use to build our shared spiritual practices off of. And the way that I envision my day in this, I envisioned uh, getting to wake up with my partner who will be part of building this. Who I haven't found yet, but I believe is being prepared for me as He's I'm being prepared coming, for Jesus. him. I believe it. 
Um, I get to wake up. I get to feel the warmth of the sunlight streaming through the windows in our beautiful home. I get to wake up, begin to get dressed, go down into the way that our personal private living space is connected to a communal kitchen where maybe there have been folks preparing breakfast. Maybe they're up a little earlier because I'm not an early morning person. Um, but no, some you other are folks not. are. I am not. And I, I own that. And I honor <laughs> that about myself. I get to go. I get to interact with folks. I get to eat some food. I get to step out into the warmth and the sunshine. I get to walk along a path where nature is all around me, where people are, again, cultivating um, both wild and organized landscapes that are producing food, that are producing other kinds like flowers that are that are producing bees even though i have some tension around bees we need, um, the, bees. Producing... We need the bees i know we need the bees and so i honor I'm, them i'm and letting I want the them bees be live there. like there yes. is a bunch of bees like building a nest <laughs> in my firewood and i'm like y'all can just have it exactly all around exactly so pollinator gardens the whole thing i get to walk back i get to walk by water living by water is so critical to me the sound of streaming water that i'm getting here right now is so important I get to walk to the place where I would be doing my particular work, um, but also walking past folks who are doing work around food, who are doing work around um, the construction and maintenance of our homes, who are doing all sorts of, of work that involves our whole selves and our whole bodies. When I get to finish that day of work, I get to leave home. I get to walk through the streets and the paths that are in our community. I get to, you know, purchase things from folks who are making them or barter things, the different ways that we may exchange, um, maybe bring home some food for my family. I get to be part of cooking dinner and sitting down to a family meal with some folks. We're laughing, we're sharing stuff. Over the radio comes the news that the candidate for president who we've worked for, a person who shares our values, a person who is committed to justice and equity in policy, a person who is committed to reparations and restoration in policy has just been elected. And so at this dinner, we get to celebrate and we're, we're jumping up and down, we're cheering, we're clapping hands, we're so joyful over our meal. At the end of dinner, some folks might be sitting around a fire, inside or outside. I want to be sitting out at the porch. I want to be looking out into the night, looking over the water that's near my home, um, having a cider with, with a friend who's a part of my home community. And then eventually I want to head back to bed with my lover um, to celebrate the day that I have just gotten to go through and to, and to be at rest, to be at peace, um, and to feel finally, truly, actually safe because I've created the world that is built around valuing my life and my safety and my well-being. Brandy, that was, that was beautiful. That was really, be and I don't have a vision yet, so I can't even come after that with something. I have to think about it. And so I, that was really beautiful. And I hope we can get there. That sounds like an amazing thing that we need right now. And I think, you know, one of the greatest things that we still have at our disposal, regardless of all the things that are going on right now is our imagination. Yes. And we have to use it, mm -hmm. use our imaginations collectively, you know, and we do this just in the real world too, by not being able like each of us can't do everything we can't right. have our foot in every single movement mm -hmm. and that's the beauty of having a community yes. of activism act activists and having a community of just people who are willing to profit share or any kind of just system that can help and create some capital and create some change so yes. tell tell me something when you were hearing that vision how did that feel for you it felt great. It felt like, wow, this is actually something I can, I can see. And it helps me to think about what I could possibly think about when I think about the future, instead of thinking about it through being fearful and thinking, oh, well, what's going to happen with this? And what's going to happen with that? Just allowing myself to just think without, without limits. 
Yeah. Which, ironically, as you get older, is a little harder to do. It, it is. We have to honor our, <laughs> our, our children and our young people who have a capacity for imagining new things that we slowly crush by putting them through the school system. But yeah. there are still a lot of young folks. I, you know, I want to give props. There's here in Montgomery County, there are some amazing young folks who are like, I will not be crushed. <laughs> and who are constantly fighting for racial equity, for climate justice. Um, amazing, amazing students who are constantly fighting um, against folks who want to tell them that they need to be divided in school systems and maintained in inequitable places in school systems and denigrated and separated from their peers. So, so our young people, they are leading. They are saying, stop shooting us. Stop letting us be shot in our schools. So I just want to honor the radical imagination of our young people who refuse to be told that they can't have the kind of future that they need. Rashida, was there something in particular that when you heard this, you were saying, like, that speaks to something that I've always wanted? I would say having a leader that is in alignment with... Um, what I truly, truly believe in and something that would radically push the culture and push us forward. And not just us as black people, but at, but just people of color and human beings mm -hmm. that were really looking for those voices. Like, for example, I was watching this uh, documentary about um, the border mm -hmm. and it was about this group of, of folks who decided to travel along the um the Mexican border, the border of between Mexico and, and America, mm -hmm. and it's it's uh, like over seven hundred miles of different varied terrain. They hiked through some of it. They went on horseback through some. Mm -hmm. They you know canoed. It was just a, a just a very multimodal trip that they took. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys um as part of the I forgot his name and I have to find the find the the name of the documentary but one of the one of the men who was a part of it actually it wasn't it was an immigrant he was here illegally with his mother mm -hmm. and became a recipient of the national geographic like a photography award mm -hmm. and just watching him and listening to his story i was like you know if i didn't know any better i would say this guy has a definite shot at running for office I was like, he's, he's got the story, you know, he, he did what people believe know that most immigrants aren't really willing or wanting to do and became a citizen, but you know, like doing that work of becoming a citizen mm -hmm. and also dispel seeing like the documentary dispel a lot of those myths yeah. about who comes and, and why mm -hmm. that it's not just quote unquote Mexicans who are trying to get here that it's actually folks from Central America and that they're escaping really horrible things, Absolutely. which, you know, and to kind of imagine a radical ticket, like I thought he would be a great presidential candidate. And then I thought, you know, Marianne Wilson or Williams, I think her last mm -hmm, name is, mm -hmm. get her to be like the Department of Peace. Yes. You know, <laughs> that's kind of how I've been thinking about it. Sometimes it's easier for me to go from the top down sure. <laughs> than it's for me to go from the ground up. But I was like, you know, that the, the, the Department of Peace needs to be a thing. And she needs to be the person that's in charge of it. Mm -hmm. You know, Andrew yeah. Yang can run the coin. We just change the name and call it the Department of the Coin because mm -hmm. we all know what it is. Yeah. You know, it just and really get and maybe he's not even the most radical person. Maybe what his ideas are great, but maybe there's someone else that's got something even better than Andrew Yang came up with. Mm hmm. You know, but just being able to freely think about that, like, I just really, first of all, I appreciate you pushing that because I would have probably not opted for a subject like this <laughs> because as, as I've said numerous times, I have some, this is exposing one of my, one of my vulnerables, mm -hmm. <laughs> one of my vulnerable unmentionables <laughs> that I don't like, I don't like to, to discuss, but I, so, you know, we're, we're well into the crossroads. We've, we've definitely talked about a lot of different and intersecting things. Is there, what are some, what are some things that people can do? Who are some folks that they can throw their weight behind and throw their support behind? You know, what are, you know, where, and if they don't live in, in, in Maryland, 
where can people go to find these candidates, these folks that are really on the cusp and want to do some really great, amazing work? Yeah. So a couple things that I'll that I'll that I'll offer Rashida, and I think I want to I want to echo something that you just said, which is that as you heard my vision, then there are things that you're starting to envision or things that you've already envisioned about what a restructured um, top level government looks like. You, the vision is within you. And so I actually think one of the first steps really seriously, and people always wanna be like, no, I gotta act something else. One of the first steps, take time with people you know, family members, friends, colleagues, neighbors, to share some of the dreams that you have. Take time with yourself first to actually write down, acknowledge, think about the dreams that you have and write them down. Um, there's a there's a passage in Habakkuk that says like, write the vision, make it plain. We gotta do that. We gotta be bold enough to do that. And then we can go and and put it in places where a herald can run with it as the, as the verse goes on to say. Um, and once you have that, one of the things that that enables you to do is then to look around and see who's moving in ways that support your vision or who's moving in ways that support a vision that you care about. Um, I, I continue to encourage folks to take a look at your local elections. Take a look at what is going on in your city and town, in your county, um, in your state house. This is one of the, these, these are the, the offices that are nearest to us and therefore where we have the most ability to make change. Um, look at people who are building out models of what's possible. So my first thing, explore your own radical imagination. My second thing, pay attention to what's going on at your local level in your local governance. My third thing, seek out people who are building out the new. Um, one of the, oh gosh, there's so many amazing organizations doing this. Um, one of the ones that I wanna highlight, uh, two, two ones, I wanna name the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, tremendous organization working on black land and food systems that where a lot of their members are doing like beautiful radical imagining around that work. Um, I also want to lift up the Climate Justice Alliance, which is a nationwide organization of environmental justice groups who are working on building out just transition in places all over the country, in places like Jackson, Mississippi, in places like Oakland, in places like Detroit, in places like West Virginia, in places like um, New Mexico, in like across across all sorts of people, across black folks, across indigenous folks, across people of color, across rural white folks, all of us who need a very different kind of world. Um, there's, there's so many different amazing groups that are involved in the Climate Justice Alliance. There's one in your region. So check out their list. If you wanna find like, is there a group somewhere nearby me where I can get engaged? Go take a look at their at their list and go find one of their groups that's in your region and connect with them about how you can get involved. So I want us to, again, start with looking at ourselves and then sharing ourselves with one another. Move to looking around at just what's happening in your area and then seek out the things that may be happening all across the country that can inspire you. This is how we get to the new system. This is how we recognize that we don't have to put up with the shit that this current system is trying to put us through anymore. This is how we recognize what's possible for us. And this is how we support each other and gather together in building it out, in defending one another, in marshalling our resources, and in owning the fact that throughout our history, throughout all of time, that this is what we've been doing, that this is how, in fact, we have survived to this point, And this is how we will continue to not only survive, but thrive. That was excellent. That was a really good way to close it out, friend. I like that. I like what I heard. <laughs>
I am glad. Um, I'll also remind folks, y'all have gotten a whole reading list through the course of this podcast. We may yes. have to go. We may have to go back, Rashida, and like make a reading list that goes along with this. Um, but there's there are so many people who are 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 who, whose radical imaginations you can read and get inspired from um, as part of reflecting on your own radical vision. Um, eat that stuff up. If you got to have a reading list during this time because we all got extra time on our hands. Fill this, now's the time up. to do it. Yes. And fill yourself up with good stuff. Spend more time yes. reading Octavia Butler than you do. Less time listening to Lil Boosie and his foolishness. Exactly. Okay. Because I, you know, I be, I'm a nerd, but I keep my, I keep my a pulse on what's going on. <laughs> and that's you. totally fine. You know, I will, I will listen to and watch some foolishness because look. No, there's not a, there's what a... I just mentioned. The type of foolishness that I'm talking about is not even <laughs> on your radar. So don't even. That, that is true. You know what? I will not try and even pretend that, that I, that yeah. I'm there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> don't even, don't even do it to yourself. <laughs> so Brandy, do you want to give out any social media or anything um before we go um uh again i want to i want to highlight some of the folks that i mentioned uh at the beginning of this call who are running for office um because these are candidates all of them are going into the final weeks of their races so again if you're looking for someone something concrete to get together with people who are organizing for this kind of world um i want to highlight um Rick Krajewski, uh, rickforwestphilly.com. Uh, I want to hi- and he's running in Philadelphia for a, a representative seat in the state house. I want to highlight uh, Nikhil Saval. Uh, I think it's, it's Nikhil, N I K I L, Saval, S A V A L.com. Um, he's running uh, also in Philadelphia for a state Senate seat. Um, I want to highlight an amazing woman named Nydea Graves, and I don't have her uh, her social media on me, but I'll just I'll name her name. And uh, she is running for a local office in Chester County, Pennsylvania. All three of these folks are amazing folks that, that you can support, and I'll share uh, with Rashida the the links where you can go and support them. Yes, um, yes. I also want to highlight again Janice Lewis George, Janice J A N. E E S E the number four D C dot com uh, Janice for DC dot com. You can volunteer, you can donate, you can, um, you know, support her and getting out the word. If you know folks who are in DC, if you know folks who are in Philadelphia, if you know folks who are in Chester County. Um, and then lastly, right here in Montgomery County, I want to highlight Dalvin Osorio for, uh, for school board at large, uh, D-A-L-B-I-N-O-S-O-R-I-O dot com. Uh, again, where you can contribute, where you can pass the word along to your friends who live here in Montgomery County. These folks, these, these are folks I'm proud to know. These are folks I'm proud to support and mentor um, and have as part of my beloved community. And so um, please go out again. These are tremendous candidates like black and people of color candidates um, who I want to see us getting behind. You know, that's really amazing. And I actually have a couple shout outs myself, which are going to sound a little random, but I hope everybody can bear with me um, at the randomness. But um, quick couple shout outs. First shout out is to an artist by the name of Bobby Earth. I happen to follow him on Instagram and he has a new album out. I'm going to make sure I get the name of it. It is called Progression 2. Mm. It's an EP, about six songs, and it's really, really great. And in shouting him out, the song in particular that I was listening to, which is called Ultraviolet, was actually uh, produced by someone named Evan Wills, who also I follow on, on Instagram too. And I mentioned because they were like really sweet and nice. And I thought I would just kind of mention them on the podcast and like put them out there. It's really great. I'm a pretty modest, I say modest because I don't like to get too fanatic, but I I have a fanatic side as you well know, (laughs) Um, but he's, he's a great musician. I think I heard one of his songs on insecure and I've been a fan ever since. So awesome. Just really wanted to shout them out and just a shout out to all of my podcast friends. I, I can't I always forget at least one or two people and I always feel bad like like you know when you see like 
like a mom with a bunch of kids and just one of them is just like somewhere else. That's how it feels. I don't know if that's how parents feel, but that's how I feel when I forget people like, Oh Lord, I left one of my ducklings. Not like, you know what I mean? Not in an above board way, but you know, shout out to all of them. And Brandy, thank you very much for joining me. I really, really appreciate it. This was a great subject and an interesting direction that we took. And I'm, and thank you for making it, making it interesting and making it fun and palatable for everyone. Rashida, thank you so much for the opportunity to have this conversation. It is always fun to get to come on your podcast. And I'm excited for us to keep doing this work of connecting our dreams and our visions and our skills and our brilliance and all the things that we have to build the future that we need. Thank you, friend. (laughs) 